I'm going to try to be more Phil-like now. So obviously, Dr. Geller from George Mason University. We are so glad to have him here. He's going to give us a talk about what are the odds from life on Mars and life in the universe. Welcome, and thank you for coming out. Okay. Appreciate it very much. Thank Enjoy, you. Guys. All right. Uh, actually, how many people were here last year? Because I talked a bit about the Mars uh, rover, Curiosity, because it was uh, landing just about just a little before we were here. So I'll have a little more results from the Mars rover, and I will also be talking about uh, search for other planets around other stars and work that I've been doing with the SETI Institute and looking at extraterrestrial intelligence and what it may be like. So. I always learn, tell people what they're going to hear f first and then tell it to them and then remind them what they may have heard. <laughs> we'll be talking about some of the history, this uh, uh, relating to Mars, uh, the discoveries made by mariners to, the, even to curiosity. Uh, I got my masters with the assistance of the data from the Viking landers, so I will say a lot about the Viking mission talk about you know, the meteorite in 1996, claims made about that, and then the Mars Science Lab and Curiosity, and then some work that I've been doing recently related to uh, what some refer to as the Hawking um, Harmful Extraterrestrial Intelligent Hypothesis that we'll talk about. So one thing to note, you know, what's the quick rundown? And again, I'm going to be going over a lot in a relatively short period of time. Uh, this was originally prepared for a, a two-hour lecture, and I just got one hour, so we'll be running through it. But again, I know a number of you were here last year. So this just compares to that Mars is a little smaller, lower escape velocity, about 50% further away from the sun. Interesting enough, very close, similar rotation period. Just about two years period of revolution as opposed to one for the Earth. Uh, most people know our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen with 21% oxygen. Uh, Mars is about 95% carbon dioxide, 3% nitrogen, and other material as well. Atmospheric density, uh, Mars averages about 7 millibars at, you know, 7 one thousandths, or, well, uh, a very small percentage of the atmospheric density, and this gives it to you in detail. Average Global average temperature over the uh, four seasons, uh, minus 50 Celsius on Mars, 25, nice temperature here on the Earth, of course. Uh, very similar axial tilts of Mars and the Earth, and Mars has uh, considerably more eccentricity that's more oval shape than uh, the Earth's orbit, which is very nearly circular. And just to give you an idea, I'd like to go through uh, astronomy history books. And uh, this statement, actually this is, the book was published in 1902 here in the United States. Richard Proctor, a British astronomer, had actually passed away uh, just before the turn of that previous century in 1899. The book was very popular in the UK, and so it was uh, printed here, unfortunately, after his uh, death. But look what he says about the hopes of finding. The planet Mars, on the other hand, exhibits in the clearest manner the traces of adaptation to the wants of living beings such as we are acquainted with. Processes are at work out yonder, I love the words he used, in space which appear utterly useless, a real waste of nature's energies, unless, like the correlatives on Earth, they subserve the wants of organized beings. So even back then, and uh, we'll talk a little more about the history of this view, I mean, it really goes back to Giovanni Schiaparelli and his uh, examination of Mars through his telescope. In 1876, he announced the discovery of Canale on Mars. Now, that's the Italian word for channels. It doesn't mean the same thing as artificial canals in the you know, English language to Americans. And a lot of the media you know, really dropped the ball on that and not translating it properly. But boy, did it take off. And so even back then, uh, issues with the media by scientists was typical. Percival Lowell, who was an astronomy professor at MIT, 
uh, you see the uh, 1855 and 1916. He published books as early as 1895, and then he got into the Mars and its canals, and gee, it's got to be in a bode for life if there are artificial canals there. And a lot of people wonder, well, what the heck was he really seeing? Because obviously there, well, we know now that there are no canals. This is actually a sketch from a uh, NASA source uh, that Percival Lowell had made. We know there's no canals there. <clears throat> and then you have to go back, human brain tendencies to connect the dots, to really connect the dots. And people in remote sensing, I know, are actually trained to not connect the dots, which uh, can be amusing, particularly to uh, doctors who do certain tests where they use these dots to uh, try to see what you're thinking, supposedly. All right, so one of the more recent theories was that his uh, complex eyepiece actually caused him to see uh, a reflection of his own retinal blood uh, pattern there, the retina. Uh, this is one of my favorite, uh, when, when I was growing up anyway, Classics Illustrated, War of the Worlds. You just got to understand the mindset a little over 100 years ago is that most people accepted that there must have been life one more. Maybe not right at that time, but at least in the past. And in fact, there was a reward posted by the French Academy of Sciences that uh, said, we'll give a certain monetary award, I forget what it was, special equivalent in English uh, units, and so many francs to someone proving that there's life on another planet, other than Mars. It was very amusing. So here you see we started looking at Mars pretty early on in 1965. Uh, you have Mariner 4 here. And it was certainly a uh, disappointment. Uh, I'm old enough to even remember that when that uh, took place. Uh, it really looked more like the moon than Mars in those first images. In 1969, we had Mariner 6 and Mariner 7. Again, don't forget the technology is very different. I mean, the technology in this room is uh, so much uh, better than what they had back then. <clears throat> Here's Mariner 4 photographs, and you see relatively low resolution. And you can see what, you know, the picture on the left in particular, I use this one, as it looks very similar to just the moon in a sense. Um, here to the right, uh, there is some other uh, frost that uh, was distinguished in dust clouds. But to a large degree, it really was a big disappointment. Uh, Mariner 6 and 7, much more complex than Mariner 4 as far as the instrumentation. <clears throat> and people need to also remind themselves and remind uh, their congressmen and everyone else. We also had failures. Failure was part of the process of exploring. Uh, in 1969, two unsuccessful attempts by the really would be former Soviet Union, Russian. In 1971, we had a failure. The Russians had a failure. And then uh, Mariner 9 was the next uh, major successful mission to Mars. Lots of things uh, really worked against it when it first got there. A global dust storm was taking place. There uh, were features that it could make out, so it did see uh, atmospheric uh, conditions. The uh, dust storms, again, of course, related to winds and also daily variations. So now we're getting a little more information as we go along. And you also see that much higher resolution. The, um, you know, some people said, oh, well, gee, couldn't this be what uh, Percival Lowell and <coughs> Schiaparelli had seen as canal? And the actual answer, and most of the uh, people who use telescopes know, no, they couldn't get such good uh, high resolution. They would never see these features. Uh, this is Olympus Mons, the uh, largest volcano in the solar system, as taken by Mariner 9. So I also like to point out that with respect to the Viking mission, if you think today is a difficult situation getting funding, that happens throughout uh, history with our Congress. It was first approved in December of 68 for a 73 launch, and then there were all kinds of issues and costs and setbacks. 
And then uh, it was actually some congressmen who said, all right, let, we'll give you the money. Well, you launch in 75 and make sure it gets there for Independence Day 1976, the bicentennial. So uh, that pretty much worked out, but you'll see, uh, and Congress was uh, a bit upset that we didn't quite land on uh, July 4th. Uh, for good reason. Viking 1 launched August 20th, Viking 2 September 9th, 1975. There were instrumentation on the orbiter, there was plenty of instrumentation on the lander. The lander had its own camera system, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, specifically to look for organic molecules and that is the instrument with whose data uh, allowed me to get a master's degree years ago. X-ray fluorescent spectrometer, seismometer. How do you tell the interior of a planet? You need seismic waves, really, to understand the interior of a planet. And a biology lab. We really have not sent any uh, spacecraft to Mars, even to land, that had a specifically designed biology lab, except for Viking and another one, which um, uh, the Beagle, which didn't get there, so never had any results from that. Weather station, and of course, sampling arm, and even on the uh, protective aeroshell around the craft. Notice that it certainly arrived in time to make a July 4th landing, but the first picture showed that the original chosen landing site was just too, too rocky, with too much of an incline, and uh, <clears throat> so July 4th was not the day that it actually landed. Personally, I think this time is better for a different anniversary. On July 20th, 1976, seven years <coughs> after humans first stepped on the surface of the moon, we were able to have a robotic device touch down on the surface of Mars with a soft landing. The Viking cameras, I can tell you things about that, and there's funny stories about that, but I don't have the time to go over everything. The Viking orbiter itself took photographs much higher resolution than any of the previous imagery taken by the mariners. And so, again, learning more as we go. This is one that created a big hoopla. Uh, actually, not for the scientists on the mission, but for uh, people who promoted it as being a lot more than it was. On the left is actually the caption that NASA released with this image, <clears throat> and this is the so infamous face on Mars. You've got to remember the resolution of the camera, and so going back there with higher resolution imagery, gee, it doesn't all look the same. The uh, Viking orbiter image, 1976, and Mars Global Surveyor, 1998 and 2001 with uh, different solar angles, so you can see different aspects, and certainly doesn't look anything like anything artificial. This is one of my favorites. This is the first uh, processed color composite image panorama of Mars taken by the Viking lander. And to make sure the colors are correct, there are color charts, in essence, on the Viking lander itself. On July 22nd, the sample arm was supposed to be deployed. There were difficulties. And I talk about, you know, ingenious engineers. You know, all of our devices in this room, uh, my computer with, I don't know how many gigabytes, um, I, I've just got, that's actually an older one, I think I have 500 megabytes of RAM on that. Anyone want to guess the amount of onboard memory on the Viking lander? 64 kilobytes, that was it. <laughs> it wasn't a Commodore 64, but it was 64 kilobytes, that's right. And think about what uh, they had to do. And of course, everything was done uh, not in any higher order language, but in uh, machine code to reprogram the arm so that it tapped on the plate that released a cotta pin which had gotten stuck and able to go out. Here are some of the results from the uh, soil sampling from the X-ray fluorescent spectrometer. You know, silicon, iron, calcium, aluminum. And then the... Uh, the disappointment with results from the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. I'm going to come back to this, and I want you to keep this in mind when I talk about even curiosity. 
Again, there was no evidence of any organic material within the soil samples taken by the Viking robotic arm. But there were biology experiments, and uh, actually, is the Viking lander engineering model still at the Air and Space Museum? It is. Yeah, you ought to go see it. It's, you know, to me, well, it's reminiscent, but it's just incredible what they were able to pack in a single cubic foot of space on that spacecraft, which was the biology experiments. The three experiments named the uh, pyrolytic release, labeled release, gas exchange. Uh, these were the uh, PIs. I don't want to get into the details because I want to get to some of the more uh, recent stuff with curiosity. Or NASA will be upset with me here. <clears throat> and uh, Vance Oyama with the gas exchange. And then Gil Levin. Uh, Gil Levin, I believe, is still alive. He retired to some place in Arizona. But um, for many years, uh, he was in the Washington, D.C. metro area. And he still held to the fact that his biology experiment, uh, which gave a somewhat of a positive result, one might say, that something was taking place. But I also worked with the uh, Laboratory for Chemical Evolution at the University of Maryland. And they did some of their own experiments, duplicating some of the results, and really were able to uh, demonstrate that even without organics, Gill's uh, experiment could have given some of these positive, false positive results because of the, uh, what they hadn't expected, some of the nature of what was the chemical composition. Um, peroxides were quite evident in the soil. So again, the three biology experiments registered results that may have had some considered to be indicative of you know, positive results for life. But again, there was no organic material. And this is something that Klaus Bima, who uh, had to face uh, a lot of criticism, he said, look, there's just no way this, uh, the, the GCMS, uh, Klaus Bima was one of the fathers of gas chromatograph mass spectrometry, which just very simply allows you to distinguish different uh, chemical molecules by their uh, mass, as you saw in the term. So the group was able to explain away the false positives with the uh, presence of superoxides, peroxides, and even superperoxides. Love those. <clears throat> and again, Gill uh, still maintained. Uh, I remember a, um, a reporter had actually uh, contacted me to try to get a hold of Gil Levin. I actually still had a number for him back then. This is like uh, 2000 and 2000 or 2001. He was still in the DC area, even though he had sold his uh, biology company. And uh, he was still in the area. And then he moved out to Arizona. He's in his 80s right now. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, does he have other reasons? Um, if you listen to him, he does. But he still really can't explain the fact that, you know, gee, you have positive results and there's no uh, organics. He, you see, that, that's the whole battle that occurred between the two PI, uh, principal investigators of here. Uh, Klaus Bima really believed that his uh, GCMS on board Viking was good to about one part per billion. And, uh, Gil Levin was just trying to say, no, it isn't, no, it isn't. And so there's just no, no carbon compound. No organic molecules. And when you think about it, all of those experiments were looking for organic base. In other words, if you want to get into elaborate silicon base or something, it's a totally different story. Oh, let me just, because I'm, where am I? 20, all right. We're okay. Back to the show. Oops, better not do that. <clears throat> oh, that was time. That one? That will probably work. That will do it. Thank you. Sorry. All right. So let's go forward. Lots of work from the Viking. It really was an incredible uh, 
suite of instrumentation, and I do recommend you take a look at the full engineering mock-up that resides at the National Air and Space Museum downtown. I'd also like to give this one Seymour Hess. Uh, almost all of these uh, PIs are passed away these, but Seymour Hess had a great uh, sense of humor. And when they asked him in the announcement in August to give the results from the meteorology, meteorology experiment, he j this is, quote, light winds from the east, late afternoon, changing light winds from the southwest after midnight, maximum winds 15 miles an hour, temperature range from minus 122 Fahrenheit just after the dawn to minus 22 Fahrenheit. Pressure steady at 7.7 .7 millibars. He then folded his paper and then just walked off stage. He, he, he had a great sense of humor. He just had to be there. It was really funny. Uh, you also have long-term data as far as Viking Lander 1 from uh, 1976 to 1982. And Viking Lander 2, uh, though, did conk out a little early in 1980. So you have not only meteorology experiments, but also an idea of the climate, because you were able to go, well, two Martian years, roughly, which is four Earth years. The images were incredible. They were the best ever, high resolution. And I'm going to be talking about some of the other missions, and this just gives you an idea of where they occurred. Here's Viking Lander 1, where it occurred on uh, this map of Mars, Viking Lander 2. And we'll talk about uh, Oh, there's Spirit. I was wondering where Spirit was. Spirit, which isn't uh, functional right now, but Opportunity is still sending out. And then, of course, Curiosity at Gale Crater, just to give you a uh, geography sense here for Mars. Here is Pathfinder at Aris Velis. <clears throat> and there is the little uh, sojourner going out to the rock. You know, the first concept of dropping it with balloon uh, bouncing around protecting it, and then landing and setting up right. Here's some of the images. You'll note 10 kilos. I'll show you a comparison of the Curiosity to these others. Mars Global Surveyor done a tremendous job. This is one of the portions of Tharsis Canyon, which is uh, linked to the, uh, excuse me, Tharsis Bowls, which is linked uh, off of the Valles Marineris. <clears throat> it's not, it's, it's off from there. Here's a portion of Valles Marineris, just some great detail. Again, this is 20 years after Viking. And we had a mission, the Odyssey 2001. It was named Odyssey because of, if anyone remembers, um, oh, gee, who is the guy who did uh, the movie? Clark. No, he wrote the thing. Who did? Stanley Kubrick, that's the one name I was thinking about, yeah. 2001, a space odyssey, so since it was in 2001. Lots of instrumentation. Here is the rover. We may have lost spirit, but we still have opportunity. They weren't supposed to last all that long anyway, and done a tremendous job. The Phoenix mission, and uh, here you see the gamma ray spectrometer aboard the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. I detected large quantities of hydrogen, and so Let's send a craft, Phoenix, to uh, closer to the polar region. And that was a lander that was really a phenomenal uh, success. There is <clears throat> launched August 4th, 2007, 10 month journey, roughly 422 million miles in, in transit, because of what's called the uh, transfer orbits. You know, it's not a direct go a straight line or anything. It doesn't work that way. Uh, this is the engineering view of how it was going to be an entry and descent. And uh, this is an engineering mock-up in the uh, Mojave Desert where they were testing it out. Obviously, no one could be there to take an image like that. You've got to realize. And I'm going to also point something out like that uh, with respect to curiosity, which uh, they made sure no one could make certain claims. You'll know, a lot of people talk about the uh, first that Curiosity did. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that the way that the Phoenix lander was dropped down is actually a precursor to the Curiosity. Except this is a fixed lander, that, like the Viking landers, is in one place. Curiosity, of course, having wheels and can putter around the surface. Here's the uh, 
primary instruments on the Phoenix mission. And here is a view uh, taken, the uh, famous you know, <clears throat> image of where he scraped soil and what was this stuff that actually, uh, it's called, it, it, when you go from liquid to gas, a lot of people, students, uh, will say, you know, evaporation, the uh, phrase for any uh, type of uh, phase change from liquid to gas is vaporization. But if you go from, because of the lack of atmospheric pressure, um, like dry ice here on Earth, you go from solid to gas, and that's called sublimation. And that's what happens for dry ice or frozen carbon dioxide here on Earth. But it would even happen for water because of the pressures and temperatures that you're dealing with on Mars. <clears throat> and in 1996, I also like to talk about, because this was a big hoopla, it's called ALH84001. Uh, if you wonder some of the weirdness of these names that actually mean something, this was discovered in the Allen Hills in 1984. It was the first meteorite discovered in the Allen Hills. So that explains that number. This, this is one centimeter, so you get to see the size of this meteorite. Um, a little larger than I actually have a meteorite with me. Uh, that one is uh, a bit larger. But that's all you're talking about. You're talking about a rock. Uh, well, it is quite different, and there's a lot that went into, uh, this is my meteorite sample. That one's uh, about twice the size to, yeah, about twice the size, because it's about two centimeters across. This would be about the size of my meteorite, and that's a little larger. And uh, you should realize that actually it was a tremendous feat which allowed us to determine that this rock actually uh, came from Mars. And in fact, part of it's linked to the chemical analysis of the inorganic materials that uh, Viking Landa did, that we were able to uh, demonstrate that this came from Mars. But the two images below, which were used uh, by some to say that there were fossilized microbes as evidence, if you read the science papers, it's a little uh, different <coughs> view. Uh, this was the big announcement, August 6, 1996. But in the papers that were published in Science, you'll note that even uh, Chris McKay and others said none of the observations and their um, chemical analyses in and of itself was conclusive for the existence of past life. But they felt that altogether uh, that was the best answer. There are others who didn't feel that way at all. And um, in less than a year, counter papers came up explaining uh, what they were seeing in the uh, electron photomicrographs. And now we're getting to uh, current day, the uh, Mars Science Lab and Curiosity rover. Lots of instrumentation, and it's mobile. So uh, there is an added benefit. So again, the landing was very similar to the Phoenix, but you have something that's able to shoot across the sands of Mars, per se, Plenty of uh, instrumentation, as you see. Just to give you an idea of the differences, Curiosity not, is significantly larger than Opportunity and Spirit. The instrumentation is over 10 times, 165 pounds of instrumentation on Curiosity, only 11 pounds of instrumentation. Previous slide said 10, 10 to 11 pounds. The total weight, you're looking at almost a ton, nine, uh, 1,982 pounds. The, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, just 384 pounds. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you think of this Curiosity rover as uh, something like a Volkswagen Beetle, as opposed to a little toy car like the other rovers, in a sense, were. And again, Curiosity was targeted, and they were within. This is the uh, ellipse of the targeted area. They wanted to land within this ellipse, and that technically is, uh, I think, the 50% probability. And they were well within it and uh, close to their target, really excellent. Here is an image, actually, of the launch, November 26, 2011. Uh, the trip took over eight months. The total mileage traversed, again, because of uh, transfer orbits from Earth to Mars, about 354 million miles or 570 million kilometers. Now, this is obviously an artistic 
uh, depiction. There was nothing watching it. As it turns out, we have pictures from another spacecraft that actually did see some of this. But here we see it going to the atmosphere, aero braking. Again, these are all artists' renditions of this. The supersonic parachute and slowing that down and the heat shield and the heat shield's release so that it can still, um, notice what it says here. The rover's descent camera can begin taking a movie of the picture and you see how much uh, that helped uh, play in. No one wanted to say, or wanted anyone to say, even though they still can say it, there's just no stopping, that we didn't really do this going to Mars. Like those that said, in what, 2000 or 2001, that we really didn't go to the moon. We didn't want any of that, and you'll see how orbiting a spacecraft caught some of this landing. So here you see it going down, being pulled up, uh, dropping down, not being pulled up, lowering the Mars rover, just as the Phoenix had been lowered, but the Phoenix stayed in one place. This was a rover. By time curiosity touched down, it was going less than two miles an hour, and so in seven minutes, it started out into the atmosphere 13,000 miles an hour and down to two miles an hour. Pretty neat. <clears throat> and once the, uh, it was called Sky Crane. Uh, that was very clever. You see, it wasn't called Sky Crane for the Phoenix, but it had exactly the same mechanism. But it really took on, uh, took off in the uh, media. They made a big deal of the name Sky Crane. And there it is, just artistic rendition. But we do have pictures. And as I said, the neat thing about this is the uh, spacecraft was able to watch the uh, drop of it and actually even see the parachute open. There can be no question that we did go through this process and land successfully on Mars. This image is the um, <clears throat> sunspot number and talking about you know, it was uh, higher sunspot activity at the time that the Curiosity rover was landing. Here's additional images from the Mars Curiosity rover. I believe I even showed these uh, last year, so you get some close-ups. And there are some that I have that are more recent. Oh, by the way, I do want to point out this picture on the left, it's not a true color image. I mean, it almost looks like a blue sky. Well, it doesn't work out that way. And there was a reason for some of this uh, choosing coloration, contrast, and like, and it has to do with, for this particular image, the geologist wanted to get a particular contrast and color changing that would allow him to look at the sedimentation here in the Martian hills. It turns out that it ended up leaving the sky almost like a blue-gray, but that wasn't the reason, but the uh, public affairs office really picked up on that. Here's some additional uh, images from the Mars Curiosity rover. This is a ChemCam, calibration target assembly, where actually it was used to determine how well the uh, mass spectrometer was determining the chemical composition. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> and then we get an overview from the orbiter. There's the landing site. There is where it's going. It does take a while. <clears throat> and then once it gets to what's called the base of Mount Sharp to actually go into the uh, crater itself, which is actually the inner portion of the crater. These are images that I couldn't show last year because they were released after the uh, Almost Heaven Star Party last year. Uh, a lot of people find this amusing. And I had one student even come up and ask me, gee, you saw this? image on the web, why did they take a penny? It's a 1909 Lincoln penny. Well, what were those Lincoln pennies made up in 1909? Oh, copper. Complete copper, you know, not like today's. Is. <clears throat> and so they actually use a high-powered laser with that penny, and they know that it's copper, and see on the mass spec indicator that it was copper. There are two cameras. There's one on the upper mass and one on a robotic arm. That one can look underneath, as you see here, any damage from the landing, can look at the tires. And just to show, gee, it had some dust storm there. From the lower camera pointing up back to the mast camera on top, you see all the dustiness there in uh, the Martian atmosphere. 
And this I certainly couldn't show. This was released at the American Geophysical Union in December 2012. And shortly after the uh, rover had landed and they were testing out the, uh, what is it called, SAM, which is for the uh, sample analysis of the sample, and doing analysis of the sample using a mass spec. There were some rumors that, oh, you know, we've discovered some organic molecules in the surface. And, you know, I was actually upset because, gee, I know Viking didn't. And then when they actually made the announcement at the AGU in uh, December 2012, it came out, notice what it says. <clears throat> the drift where they took the samples did not contain any abundant organics. They also could not find much organics. It was just a validation of the GCMS that was on the uh, Viking. Okay, 25 minutes. <clears throat> if you want to follow along, they still, they even gave the Mars Curiosity rover its own Twitter and it talks like it's uh, talking from Mars to you. Uh, for students and for teachers who want to get the students involved, be a martian.jpl.nasa.gov and the other websites associated with the Curiosity and Mars Science Lab. So a recap of Mars. Been of interest for finding like for a long, long time. And even back when originally felt to show evidence has been targeted for study by many Mariner, Viking, Pathfinder, Mars Exploration Rovers, Odyssey, Phoenix, and now Curiosity in the Mars Science Lab. Bottom line, did Viking mission find life on Mars? No. Did the Viking mission find ruins of any ancient civilizations? No. But just because, uh, by the way, you have to understand, okay, no evidence at the Viking lander sites, no evidence at the uh, curiosity sites that has been chemically analyzed either. That doesn't mean there is definitely none anywhere, but there are other reasons why uh, most of us feel that you're not going to find any uh, native life there on Mars. Does ALH8401 contain microfossils? The consensus is no. Do we know that there's no life on Mars? As I said, no, you really don't, but we know that at the Viking lander sites, at the curiosity site where it took samples there's not life. So where else might you find life in our solar system? Once you get outside of a, you know, a region, now they've gone to different names, originally called the habitability zone or habitable zone, and it was strictly defined by astrobiologists as being that region away from the sun, that distance from the sun, where you can have temperatures 0 to 100 Celsius, so 273 to 373 Kelvin, or 32 to 212 Fahrenheit, for liquid water to exist. You still need atmospheric pressure of the right type, or it won't be in liquid form. But the idea is where, just based upon the physics, can you have that temperature range? That's the original habitability zone. Uh, now they prefer to use the term, or some prefer to use the term, Goldilocks, because you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. I'm not one of the big proponents of calling it Goldilocks. So where else might we have it? Because outside of that, you know, Mercury is, of course, too hot, also has uh, rotational problems. Uh, uh, Venus, with an atmosphere that is 90 times atmospheric pressure here on Earth, mostly carbon dioxide, runaway greenhouse effect. <coughs> Earth, great place to live <clears throat> and to have life. Mars, too low atmospheric pressure to uh, low gravity, even though it can have you know, the Martian surface temperature, particularly in the summer, which of course depends on which hemisphere you're in, <clears throat> gets, gets above freezing, no doubt. So it's technically within that range. But it's really right at the edge because it uh, wavers from that back and forward. What about the other large moons? And a lot of people like to talk about Europa as being a, a case in point where we may find life because there's got to be an ocean beneath this frozen, most of the Europa surface is frozen water. No one's questioning that. Uh, there was a mission originally that NASA had scheduled that was supposed to go in 2011, obviously didn't, but go to Europa and set out definitively if that is the case, that there's a big liquid ocean beneath the 
frozen ice that we see. There's also methane and ammonia. It's obviously not just uh, white or blue-white frozen ice. There's other colorations. Some of the largest moon is Ganymede, but its low density doesn't allow much for uh, rocky material. Io, the most uh, volcanically active uh, moon in our solar system. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, Titan. And we had a great mission to Titan, the Cassini mission, and it actually dropped a probe called Huygens. You know, problem is, it really is, you know, freezing isn't the right term with an average temperature uh, that, you know, never gets above like 50 Kelvin. You've got to realize that we're talking about that's like minus 223 Celsius. So this is uh, not a great place that you might expect life, but there's a lot of organic material there, methane, ethane. Some people t thought that there might be oceans of methane, ethane, but please remember, water has a very unique property, and that is at uh, the solid phase, in the solid phase, water actually floats on the liquid phase. You know, that's really a very rare case for all of these other liquids, the ammonia, methane, and the like. Their solid phases are more dense and would sink. What does that end up giving? You know, if you've ever gone to Minnesota and done any of that uh, ice fishing, you can break through the ice, drop a line, and actually do fishing if you, I'm not strong enough to stay out in the cold on that thing. <clears throat> but uh, I do know of people who've done it, and uh, that's because water freezes top down. But all of those other substances that I was talking about that are on Titan, they freeze bottom up. There's no liquid beneath, even a small liquid pool that's on top. It's all solid below. So some people thought, well, gee, maybe there is some hope for life in some of these moons. Uh, I do want to point out, the, again, the habitability zone. It was worked out years ago, actually. This is from a publication in 1993. And this is actually called the continuous habitable zone. <clears throat> and that is where, for a long period of time, i.e. billion of years, that you can have that temperature range 0 to 100. And you see that in this case, Mars falls out because of the fact that you know, it gets, uh, it's, it's too cold. And also, you have the atmospheric uh, consideration. But we've seen a lot more. This gives you an idea of you know, what stars. There's even a reason for looking at certain stars as opposed to other stars containing uh, planets for life. But there's a lot of stars out there we know that have planets. They're now called uh, exoplanets. Used to be extrasolar planets, now shortened to exoplanets. And here you see the three main techniques. Now, in the beginning, and the beginning being 1996, the first stars really discovered to have planets orbiting it was used what's called the Doppler shift method. By looking at the Doppler shift of the spectral lines of the stars, we knew that they were doing a little do -si do with the other, some major planets in their vicinity. And that would go for moving that. If you ever see dances on a stage, if you have a big hefty football player with one of those petite dances that they've assigned some of them with, dancing with the stars. You know. I mean, he hardly moves while the petite uh, partner is really swung around. Uh, so there's this, uh, nonetheless, even the more massive one does swing a little, and that's what you're looking for there. Since uh, Kepler was launched, uh, it has put out, what is it, 1,236 candidates. Uh, right now, I the last time I looked, I mean, it changes. Uh, the last time it was like 863 validated planets orbiting other stars. Uh, <clears throat> that number may well have gone up. <clears throat> and, uh, and then a method that's only had a handful, about a dozen at most, because it's really difficult to do. It's called the uh, gravitational lensing effect, which you have to talk a little bit about Einstein's general theory of relativity and the bending of light due to gravity. But it is a technique that has been used to discover some planet. Now, in the future, some of you may have heard of the James Webb Space Telescope. Please understand that the James Webb Space Telescope is not really a direct replacement for Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble 
uh, of course, being in the optical uh, region and able to see just little into uh, what we would call UV. UV is anything beyond what we see, basically 400 to 700 nanometers, 4,000 4, to 7,000 angstrom, so below that, Hubble was actually able to do. But the James Webb Space Telescope is really an infrared telescope. Uh, why? One of the reasons is that using a infrared wavelength and looking at the spectra that we get from these distant stars, you can actually pick out what's called absorption lines caused by certain molecules. This is an example for our own Earth where you have absorption molecules, ozone in the infrared, and of course water and carbon dioxide, so you get a better idea. And if we do get James Webb Space Telescope up and we get some spectra from its um, infrared spectrometer, then uh, maybe we can see if the atmosphere of these planets may have something. Now, in the final, <clears throat> what do I have, 15 minutes roughly to go, I want to talk about something else that I've uh, been involved with and uh, it has to do with search for extraterrestrial intelligence and also what's the likelihood of extraterrestrials being nice to us or in this case, uh, if you ever saw this, episode 89 of the Twilight Zone had the Canamids who, it starts out kind of uh, amusing, you know, what were they really there for? They promised to help mankind. This one left a book at the United Nations simulator, in the United Nations, of course, that they spent quite a time trying to translate. They got the title, it said to serve man, and everybody thought that was wonderful. And then it turns out, it's a cookbook. You know, I mean, they were here to fatten us up, to bring to their planet, to slaughter like cattle. Dr. Kelly, you're actually at 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Hour and a half. Oh, hour and a half. Oh, then I'm here. Well, I'll, I'll leave time for questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I brought the uh, episode of. Um... <laughs> well, hey, the Twilight Zone. See, I really do have it. Never leave home without it. All right. <clears throat> so. I'll still try to end so I can take questions. Back in 2010, this is a quote from Stephen Hawking. Uh, of course, he uses his computer to talk for him. This was a picture that was taken at that time. Uh, <clears throat> notice what he said. To my mathematical brain, the numbers alone make thinking about aliens perfectly rational. The real challenge is to work out what aliens might actually be like. By the way, in future slides you'll see uh, and this is something working with the SETI Institute. Alien today, you must realize, is usually applied just to someone who's uh, not an American citizen. Um, <clears throat> and so, in lieu of that, you know, I was always told in any of my talks and everything, just say extraterrestrial intelligent, don't say alien. Uh, that being aside, I mean, back in 2010, this is what Hawking said. The real challenge is to work out what aliens might actually be like. They would only be limited by how much power they can harness and control. Could be far more than what we first imagine. Perhaps nomads looking to conquer and colonize whatever planets they reach. I imagine they might exist in massive ships, having used up all the resources from their home planet. And if they ever visit us, thinks the outcome would be similar to what happened with Columbus and uh, Native Americans. That set off a flurry of uh, activity. I mean, don't forget the people at the SETI Institute. It's kind of their business, and for him to say, oh, don't send out any messages and don't do that. <clears throat> well, that would put some people out of work. So, what is the basis for his argument, by the way? Well, of course, it has to do with the billions and billions of stars, as Sagan might say, an estimated 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. When you go through how many are the different type, how many live a certain number of years and don't live long enough to uh, harbor the evolution of life. Based upon the Kepler mission estimates, there are at least 100 billion planets out there 
in our galaxy. Some say uh, there may well be more, and maybe so, but these are statistical studies done now that we have the data from the Kepler. But please remember, you're still looking at a very huge volume. This is a quick uh, view of the Milky Way galaxy. It's really any, any spiral galaxy. Uh, we're about 26,000 light years, which is eight kiloparsecs, out from the center of our galaxy. And you're talking about a galaxy that's about 150,000 light years in diameter. Uh, you can be as much as uh, eight, 10, 20,000, and you see the thickness really varies, light years in thickness, and there's a lot of globular clusters all around. Now, I'm not going to go into dark matter halos and all that other stuff. The point is, even if you have so many billions of stars and so much of a <clears throat> number, large number, I don't know what large is called anymore, or humongous or very large or whatever, uh, and Hubble Space Telescope tells us uh, from the uh, deep field imagery, ultra deep field, estimate at least 150 billion galaxies in what's called the observable universe. I mean, that's a lot of possibilities, and certainly uh, no one's going to disagree with that. But again, I do want to point out the volume is huge. Uh, again, it's hard to even think of what huge is. So, oh, before I go that, let me finish up with this huge volume. One thing I do like to do, and I know this has been done at some po star parties and all, and um, uh, gee, I knew the guy who used to do this at some of the star parties. Uh, actually at U.S. Geological Survey. Um, the yeah, the solar system walk. Enormous. Yeah. I do one in the uh, lecture hall. It's a big lecture hall, so I can get a lot in there. Are, and I use a model that's one inch to a million miles. And on that, I mean, you can quickly go through, you know, the Earth. It's about three yards away. And you go uh, almost five yards, say, to uh, Mars, and then quickly adds up. So Pluto is basically a football field away. But the nearest star we'd still be at Boston, Massachusetts, roughly, on that scale. I mean, the distances are enormous. So even though you have a lot of possibilities, the distances are still quite large. So in 1960, I believe it was, at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory just down the road here, Frank Drake, here you see Frank Drake at a conference. Um, I was at a conference American Astronomical Society in uh, Baltimore, obviously Baltimore Convention Center. That's the old convention center, not the new one here in the 90s. And in 1960, he, with a couple of his colleagues, came up with this equation that looks at, well, how many intelligent civilizations could be out there in our galaxy right now? And it goes through some of the probabilities that you'd have to deal with. And again, ultimately looking for the number of technology technologically advanced civilization in the galaxy that may send out messages and we would be able to detect. And here's the factors that they came up with. Uh, the rate of star formation, which really wasn't well known, and ironically the guess that they took was pretty good in the end uh, with studies from Hubble Space Telescope that came many years later and others. Uh, they really didn't do too bad with their rough estimate of 10. Uh, fraction of stars that have planets, they really had no idea. Today we have a much better idea with the Kepler mission. Oh, I think I uh, forgot to mention Kepler finds stars by the eclipse method where, you know, the light from that star is being diminished. We would say occultation. <clears throat> I talked about the uh, <clears throat> radial velocity or the Doppler shift one I forgot to mention the uh, Kepler one uses. So here's all the factors and just as a comic relief this was done as a cartoonist who goes by the handle XKCD he came up with the flake equation. The Drake equation is real that gives you the number of uh, possible civilizations 
out there. This flake equation I just thought was cute and I've been using it as a comic relief in between. And what it's trying to do, and as you see here, even with conservative guesses in a similar manner of the Drake equation, there's a huge number of credible sounding alien sightings out there available to anyone who wants to believe. And so this gives you an idea of uh, those people who uh, actually believe that aliens have. Uh, it turns out to be a rather large uh, percentage, particularly in certain countries. I do want to also touch upon what's called the Fermi paradox. There's so many aliens, where are they? Really first written down by, uh, actually not Fermi, but a, a colleague of his, because he thought this actually occurred at a lunch table. Wouldn't you like to be a fly on that wall, listening to what was going on at that lunch table? Uh, basically, there's a lot to consider here. Consider the question, did life only start once on Earth? And it relates to how long it takes life to evolve versus how long it would take life to spread throughout the planet. For example, you know, some, uh, if you ever considered, well, we talk about the evolution of human beings, how come there weren't more or different types of human beings on, say, different continents? Because while it took a long time for humans to evolve and then come out of Africa, it was relatively quick in spreading our human species throughout the globe, even though sometimes we weren't aware of where certain humans were, and I'll also come to that. So going along those lines of thought, life got started on Earth relatively quickly. And there's DNA evidence to support that all life on Earth comes from some primordial beginnings of life. Our biochemistry is the same, the DNA, and there's a lot of factors that come into play. It really can't be a, a coincidence. My, um, mitochondrial DNA in particular. <clears throat> average time needed to spread throughout a region compared to the average time needed to evolve. I have a lecture that I do for my astrobiology class. It's a 90-minute lecture in and of itself. I'm going through this in just a minute. There may be a few or even a few hundred intelligent species out there in our galaxy, but even if there are, even if there are billions, the distance between these civilizations would really cause for some difficult. But again, if there really are billions, why haven't we been visited by them? Because relatively speaking, the time to spread throughout the galaxy, that I do a rundown a calculation with my class, spend time on that, compared to the time to evolve life or intelligent life, it's very quick to spread throughout the galaxy regardless. There are other issues limiting that deal with uh, space travel itself. This was one thing that I threw together for a paper that's coming out uh, early next year. If you were just using chemical propellant, boy, we'd be in trouble. The amount of chemical propellant, chemical propellant, required is on the order of 10 to the 119th kilograms. This is a voyage to, say, uh, Alpha Centauri. Based upon the production of chemical, chemicals, that's global chemicals, it would take 10 to the 107th years <laughs> to produce all those chemical propellants that the ship would require. Uh, this, by the way, is a NASA design for a ion uh, propulsion engine, and this is actually testing the initial concepts of a ion propulsion at uh, Lewis Research Center. So if you want to get a lot more energy and then you go to the old, you know, antimatter and have total annihilation, that still requires, well, 10 to the 8 kilos of antimatter. And how do you contain antimatter is a big issue because if it touches any matter, it's total annihilation. You can work out the energy regardless, 10 to the 15th kilowatts hour, just to give you an idea, that's the total electrical energy generated on Earth in a single year. How are you going to get that to a single spaceship that's going on an interstellar mission? And something else that's often overlooked, and that is reliability. And you can actually have an analogy to uh, humans in our own bodies and our uh, reliability and how long things last. I had someone who had a heart problem in June and um, through the hospital and then a nursing home and still an assisted living 
f facility. Things break down, you know, cognitively maybe fine, but it's like one thing breaks down and then other things start breaking down too. Uh, <clears throat> so don't forget, duty cycle 24-7. For human beings, it's 24-7 also. And you can work out the engineers have a uh, formulation of what you would need is what's called mean time between failure. And the mean time between failure of instrumentation aboard a starship must be on the order of 1,774 years. You know, I'm not aware of any refrigerators or washing machines that last that long. <laughs> <clears throat> now, to the point of Professor Hawking's comment about, well, it'd be like Christopher Columbus coming to America. First, you should understand, uh, this is the, an old typical illustration, you know, Columbus coming, all the gallantry and everything's, you know, great, right? And um, most people realize, well, that's not exactly how it happened. Now, on the first trip, there are actually three trips by Columbus. <clears throat> A more modern view is depicted here, and that is... Uh, really the slaughter of Native Americans in that, uh, well, really the Caribbean. Everyone knows he didn't reach the uh, mainland of North America. But again, go through and really read the history. There's an excellent book that I reference, again, in a paper that's coming out next year, that talks to the um, actual reports of different crew members and what happened. And gee, the first encounter by Columbus he was much nicer and spoke uh, rather highly of what kind of civilization he discovered here. But in each successive trip, he was so pressed upon, and I'm not saying it's an excuse, but he was so pressed upon to get some, if you want to say, riches out of it. And also then the crewmen who came with him uh, wanted to get... Uh, well, you know, rape and pillage, I'm afraid, was going on. So it's true that it was disastrous for the Native Americans, but what's overlooked by Stephen Hawking is the fact that we're all the same species. We are all human beings. The Native Americans maybe did not know about the Europeans, and the Europeans didn't know about the Native Americans, but we are the same species. <clears throat> The one that talks about Christopher Columbus? Gee, I, the reference is in a paper that's coming out, but I don't remember the name. If you email me at my university address, which is H. Geller, H G E L L E R, at gmu.edu, I actually still have the reference in my office. I have the papers in my office, but uh, I don't, sorry, I don't remember the name of the book that uh, the historian put it together. In. Great book, I really do recommend it. So I came up with an alternative to the Drake equation that I call the uh, Geller ETI sex equation. And it relates to the fact that you know, there have been a lot of reports, which were alluded to by XKCD, uh, of people having sex with extraterrestrials. What's the likelihood of that, really? Okay, We're talking about, first of all, different species. So I start out with um, the number of Oh, what the result is, is supposed to be the number of extraterrestrials with whom humans could actually have a sexual relationship. And you start with the number of civilizations in the Milky Way that are intelligent enough to get electromagnetic emissions, and so that's from the Drake equation. The fraction of extraterrestrials with just the right sugar stereoisomer. You know, in your DNA, and the sugars that we all eat, <clears throat> sucrose, uh, which is actually a combination of the simple sugar, glucose and fructose. <clears throat> They're called stereoisomers right-handed. It has to do with how they refract light passing through them. So there exist actually two different sugar. They're exactly the same. Glucose comes in a left-handed version and a right-handed version. Again, this is how it refracts light. <clears throat> and you would have to have that same right-handed sugar, and of all things, left-handed amino acids. We use 20 amino acids. There's a lot more amino acids. What's the probability? Uh, here, these are pretty basic. You know, you have a one out of two chance as far as just for all the left-handed or right-handed, etc. But then there's the interpretation of the codon, uh, the three uh, 
<clears throat> sequence, the three nucleic acid sequence that then determines what amino acid is in the chain in that protein. And you can go through, again, what that would be. Then the fraction of extraterrestrials with the same chromosomal length. And don't forget, if you really are going to have sexual relations with an extraterrestrial, you have to have your cells able to penetrate the cell membrane. The structure of the cell membrane is amazingly common among uh, all life on uh, Earth, all of the um, organisms that have sexual reproduction. It's amazingly similar. That wouldn't be the case with an extraterrestrial. It would have to have evolved literally in the exact same way. And what's the likelihood? Very, very low. <clears throat> so, I did want to give an example of a true clash of species in the sense, but there's even a situation there. In 1662, you had the last definite sighting of a Mauritius dodo bird. <clears throat> I still remember, for whatever reason, uh, there is a full skeleton of a dodo bird at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, and that's where I used to go. I used to go to a, called the Hayden Planetarium so many years ago, <clears throat> before the Rose Science Center uh, that exists today. And I still remember this model of, you know, gee, this poor creature uh, driven to extinction by humans. So it turns out it wasn't just humans, and as it turns out, it was very early on. So what happened here? Again, most of the extinction was due to hunting, but humans were not the only ones who came to that island once it was discovered. These creatures, this is an island off of Madagascar, and you know there's a lot of unusual creatures on Madagascar because that got separated from the African continent. This island separated even more so, and so the dodo was able to thrive until humans came. And by the way, rats that humans harbored on their ships that came there were one of the biggest uh, problems. You know what the rats would eat? Eggs. Yes, exactly. And if dodo bird, they, they, they would not fight a dodo. I mean, they have significant beaks. An adult dodo bird can defend itself against a rat. But you know what? With the nests and the eggs, you got a problem. So here you have humans coming to an island and just driving to extinction. But remember, humans could use that dodo bird because it had the exact same biochemistry that's in every single cell in our bodies. If it didn't have the same biochemistry, the chemicals would be useless. For example, all of those left-handed sugars. I mean, you can have tons of it. It wouldn't do any bit of good to you and I because we couldn't metabolize it. And the RNA and DNA in our cells are all with right-handed dextroribose sugars, or deoxyribose sugars, okay? Whatever sugar you're using, it's all right-handed. And the amino acids, all of ours, are left-handed. And yet, and we've tried this in the development of, in the famous Stanley Miller experiments, the amino acids that develop out of the Stanley Miller experiment are 50% dextro, 50% levo. It's a 50-50 shot. But you and I couldn't live with the dextro amino acids. We need levo amino acids, left-handed amino acids, and right-handed sugars. So, and I guess this is a blatant plug. <clears throat> we'll still have about 15 minutes for questions. <clears throat> Oops, let's get back to this. I do have... Uh, Contributions to two books. Actually, this is a preprint. There's even a mistake in the cover title here, so I wouldn't let this out. We found over 100 mistakes in the original manuscript that went into this. But by the end of the month, I should have a book coming out, All the Secrets of the Solar System, and I specifically did it in large print. See, my friends and I are getting old, and it really works better to have large print. There's no pictures, no illustrations in here. It is simply a non-fiction book that um, I, uh, I will be donating copies to some assisted living and nursing homes so that their residents can actually read about the solar system and the like. That was my main purpose there. 
And I'm a contributor to a book that's coming out at the end of the year. It was supposed to come out this month, but there was a problem with the printing presses in uh, a foreign country. Well, even the publishers spring, it's German. But I was surprised to hear they're using printing presses in India. And there were some issues there. In this one, so this should be coming out at the end of the month. This is coming out uh, hopefully in January 2014. It's called Extraterrestrial Altruism. Again, I was part of a team of a multidisciplinary uh, team that was psychologists, sociologists, astronomers. Uh, what else did we have? Just about every, even a lawyer, by the way, even a lawyer put in <laughs> some of his, uh, well, it has to do with what do you do if some creature from outer space, if a cannon actually did come, how would that affect laws and what would we be dealing with in the legal system? So, I mean, he has a point to be made and he, uh, gives his view of how that would uh, affect uh, human society. And, and I think you will find it a very uh, interesting read once it does come out, if I say so myself. So recap on my debate with Hawking really is nothing so new. <clears throat> Back in the 80s, and this has really happened, you know, if you think you're the first to do it or say it, oftentimes you'll find someone has before. Uh, in 1985, Ben Finney uh, quoted as saying, interstellar wars will be extremely rare, much rarer than warfare here on Earth. Michael Hart, also uh, 1985, consequence of the enormous distances between the stars. So what I have tried to point out to you and address, there is a lot of space between not just the planets, but when you talk about the stars and the time that it takes to travel that, as it turns out, and you can read in extraterrestrial altruism, how by their nature, these uh, travelers cannot be malevolent. Or for the most part, and again, I'm not the psychologist of the group by any means, they wouldn't survive a trip that has to last over many generations. <clears throat> and if anyone can go back to uh, Pogo, uh, we've met the enemy and he is us, uh, as even, and I know this is really stretching it, but there was a quote that I got from one of our IT uh, support people because one of my colleagues was arguing with him about the security level and our systems and everything, and he was afraid of losing data. And, and this quote I love, he said, you're more likely to lose data from one of the IT support people than you are from any uh, attack from the outside. On campus, that's just the way it is. <clears throat> so it was really uh, an interesting comment. And uh, in this book, Extraterrestrial Altruism, I talk about you know, Hawking and any of us really don't have to worry about any extraterrestrials as being a problem. The enemy really will be uh, us uh, if we're going to destroy ourselves not any extraterrestrial. So I think that allows about 15 minutes for questions then. If uh, you have any questions here. Yes? What about uh, panspermia and the possibility that uh, life may have either evolved from Mars or come to Earth from outside? Not likely in all reality. That's really a fringe view. You ask the community of astrobiology, uh, say over 90, 5% would say no. And there are a lot of problems with panspermia, and I know it's still being pushed quite a bit. And um, there is uh, there's a British astrophysicist and an Indian astrophysicist who have been working together on this. They get a lot of press play, uh, but I'm sorry that you know the view is the science behind that is just lacking. Yeah. I grew up in Texas, and I had the alien abduction experience many times. A whooshing sound in the middle of the night, a sensation of floating, waking up the next day with a weird sensation in my throat and a weird taste in my throat. Now, I remember that these were people. They weren't aliens. And later on when I grew up, I had surgery. And when I woke up after surgery, I had the same sensation in my throat <laughs> and the same taste in my throat. And later when I grew up and experienced nitrous oxide, I heard the same whooshing sound. 
Okay. As far as probing, well, there's an animal husbandry device that's in common use. Okay. We have met the enemy and he is us. It's the military. Okay. These were people doing this. And human experimentation has been going on quite a bit in this century. And after World War II, we brought a whole mess of those doctors over to this country. And I just happen to be living downwind of the nuclear test sites. So I don't think that there are aliens traveling billions of, billions oh, okay. of miles. Mm -hmm. It's people. And who wants to do something like that to you? Well, look no further than the Pentagon. Any other? I found out about the animal husbandry device by watching a show on PBS. And that was done to me as a child. Again, but not extraterrestrials no, not coming not so far, so long. Uh, the the X-Files episode where <laughs> Mulder has the same experience, and he hallucinates aliens, and then he sees people. Well, if you're under the influence of drugs, yeah, that's a key thing. And if you're mm -hmm. anesthetized, and you see doctors wearing face masks and goggles with lights on, you don't know what it, it is, it's an alien it experience. Could, yeah. It is an alien experience, and it's a terrifying thing. And that for me as a child, uh, probably about six times. <laughs> what part of Texas were you? I was in Arlington, Texas. My father worked at Chance Vault. Oh. Uh, doing uh, stuff with Regulus 1 and Regulus 2 and Crusader uh, aircraft. It was the first three missiles all the yeah. Regulus 1 series. And uh, I would wake up in the middle of the night and I see a, a bright light and the, the bushes outside my window would be going like that. And then I'd hear this whooshing noise. And then I would feel like I was being hauled off. I was on a cold metal slab. And there was these weird people around me wearing masks, but there were people. And that was before there was an alien cover story, OK? Yeah. That's before they made movies and the Betty and Barney Hill thing. Oh. And, and the yeah. whole thing where they were programming people, oh, it's the aliens okay. doing it. Well, it's people <laughs> on this planet. And you have no further to look in the last century of history to see that people are capable of that and much much worse. Okay. Let me take some questions from others. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, I, I would appreciate uh, clarification of the uh, hydrocarbons that we know exist in interstellar medium, the, the presence of organics, uh, and, and prebiotic uh, structures. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but... what, you're, what you're saying about Mars uh, is what? I mean, the organics are there. Yeah, but because of the, uh, and I think in particular it was the Phoenix mission that examined the gamma rays yeah. and the surface bombardment. Remember, it doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it and everything. You, the the volatil volatility of such organics yeah. just doesn't allow them to hang around together much. Exactly. And, and that's the real issue. It's not that they're not there. I agree. They're in interstellar media all over the place. They're there. So, but... They've got to hang together for a lengthy period of time. Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah. That form structures and maintain the structures, and the radiation basically breaks down and attacks molecule immediately. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's the key. Exactly. You had a question over there? Yeah. Actually, uh, just three points. But one is the, uh, the big, long valley, Valley Marineris. Uh, that could have been seen by Schiaparelli and no, actually, no. They didn't even have the, not, not theirs. You guys got better resolution than those guys did. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Right. And with tongue firmly in cheek, I found a structure on Mars using the high rise uh, um, uh, camera, that, which, which gives really good stuff. And it's firmly, clearly obvious that they, I saw a piglet. You know, from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> 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 Although there's some doubt about the, the hoof, it might be a Jamaican meat patty instead of. Hey, if I may say, it's, um, oh, now I forgot his name. There's, uh, who's the bad astronomer? Phil Plate. He has an excellent page about, I think it's called Paradolia, 
and how we see things in formations. And it's oh, yes. not what we think it is, but we're so used to certain uh, associations. It's right. really more of a psychological oh, yeah. thing. You can't help doing it. You can't help. And the third thing is, um, if you uh, are interested in images of Mars, uh, there's a uh, J-Mars, which you can get to at the, through NASA, has an incredible set of images, pretty much all of them, uh, NASA images from uh, first to, to now. They're still taking things. And the students can actually uh, together analyze those images. And I'm talking you know, middle school up to like sophomore and uh, come up with hypotheses. And if they come up with a good enough investigation that they'll actually um, target a new run of, I guess, I forget which, uh, one of one of the uh, orbiting, I think it's oops, not high rise, the other one. Um. MRO. Margin yeah, it's MRO. Uh, has a really good camera, not quite as good as high MGS, isn't it? Mars Global Surveyor is the one. I think MG, didn't MGS die? I don't know. But anyway, MGS is dead. Yeah, yeah it died in 11. Yeah. They've been doing it for about 10 years, and they're coming up with very interesting stuff. I've looked at some, some of the uh, best of. Quite interesting. You have something else, Dave? Just another thought about your uh, question about what was Chaparelli seeing and what was Lowell seeing. The, um, uh, the uh, radiation in the eyeball was certainly the case for, for what he, he saw canals on Venus as well. But Venus is so, so much brighter. And, and that's pretty much applied there. I mean, he was seeing the canals everywhere. But you know, his, his, his mindset at the time is a very interesting sociological thing because the absolute um, uh, uh, epitome of modern civilization was what in the late 19th century? Building canals. And the whole Lowellian theory, the whole Laplacian theory was Mars has to be older than we are. Therefore, it has to be more advanced. And so they saw them. I mean, George Ellery Hale, in 1908, saw faint interlocking curved filaments next in, uh, uh, near Sirius Major, where Edom is, where we know Crater Edom is now. He didn't call them craters because he wasn't looking for craters. Yeah. That's the, it's a psychological flaw. That, that reminds me, I uh, had heard a talk, a professor from uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, came, and he did a talk about, uh, he's actually an uh, anthropologist, and he talked about all these Midwestern uh, yes. things that they go through, and he had a, a great talk about, um, with respect to, quote, unidentified flying objects, and he took some old sketches, because they didn't have photographs then, of what were called unidentified flying objects. And they were often things that were taking place at a time. One of the first instances of a report of unidentified flying object it looked very much like a balloon. A hot air balloon, I mean, you know, that yeah. you're not it's just a balloon. The great airship conspiracy. And then in, I think, right around the turn of the century, 1901 or something, there's one guy, gee, it looks like a Zeppelin. So, you know, it's like uh, the technology at the time kind of took their mind hold, and that's exactly. the key. Exactly. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm going to kind of express my opinion, and then you, you can react <laughs> to it. Because, um, um, like, during your talk, you're talking about how, you know, we've been sending rovers and robotic missions to Mars. Um, if we ever were to encounter another civilization, uh, because they can travel here, I think it's extremely likely that we wouldn't encounter creatures, you know, the, you know, biological creatures, especially because, you know, traveling those long distances, keeping them alive, you know, the spaceships are being bombarded by cosmic rays, uh, you know, in all likelihood, we'd probably encounter machine intelligence, you know, and we're already oh, trying to do that. I mean, we're sending rovers to Mars, we've landed on Titan, you know, we, the only planet humans have gone to is, is the moon, which is, of course, extremely close to Earth. The farther away we go, I mean, it's hard to imagine we're going to be sending humans out to the outer solar system, you know, any time in a long time. So if we do encounter um, intelligence that's, that's here, it's going to probably be machines. But, but you see, even, 
I don't disagree with that, but even before that, because it still would take time for those machines to travel that distance. You know, the furthest machine that we have, you know, is Voyager 1 right now, which, you know, we may say is right at the edge of our solar system. And it's been a long time. So it's still easier for electromagnetic radiation oh, yeah. to travel yeah, those I'm, distances. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying if it were to happen, I think it, it would, would be, be more, more likely a robotic mission. Sure. Like creatures that we could have yeah. sex with. No, I, <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with you. Don't yeah. limit machines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this young lady had a question. I want to make sure we get it. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering how fast Curiosity moves. Um, do you know the speed? It's just like a few. Half a mile an hour? Yeah, roughly. Of course, one of the reasons is if you make a mistake, if you hit something you don't want to hit, there's no, no automobile mechanic you can call from the AAA to come down and it's fix after, it. There was about 20 decisions, and then it moves. And there's another 20 decisions. And it's semi-autonomous. They, they have to do it in batch process. Yeah. OK, I thank you for your time. If you have any other questions, because my time's kind of passed here, you can come up and talk to me. That's fine. Who's the next speaker or whatever this to? Oh, oh you, you've got a while, though, before you speak. Right? Oh, is there another one right now? Is there anyone? Oh, there's dinner, so I'm sure you guys want to eat. There is one thing about structures on Mars. The photo award at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock is the next event. And then at 5.30 is dinner. 5 o'clock are awards? Yeah, it's the awards. Okay. If you took a look yeah. at an aerial photograph of the city of Troy before it was excavated, all you would see is an eroded mound. Okay? If you took a look at an aerial photograph of 90% of the Egyptian pyramids, all you would see are eroded mounds. And that's only if we're talking about three to four thousand years of erosion. So I don't think that you can say with certainty one way or the other until you actually go there and take a look and see. Because at one time, Mars did have a magnetic field. It did have a molten core. And when that stopped protecting it from cosmic radiation, that would have, in effect, sterilized the surface of the planet. So okay. you cannot say with absolute certainty one way or the other until you have more data than we have now. Okay. Well, I, I don't I, think I, anyone I, was I, saying that we definitely no, say. I didn't, yeah. I didn't hear him say that. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying well, that. it's a matter of, I, I know that people like to say absolutely one way or absolutely the other way. No. But you can't say that until you've actually been there and taken a look at it. Only politicians want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Only politicians make absolutes. Right. <laughs>